Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Stantis from the National Museum of Natural History. I'm a blonde woman wearing a blue sweater sitting in a room with a large white cabinet and a windowsill behind me. On screen is a composite image, um, sorry, on screen uh, currently shows the title of our webinar, Accessing Archaeology. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for today's Smithsonian sponsored event, Accessing Archaeology. With help from the Disability Employee Resource Group and the National Museum of Natural History Education and Outreach Team, we are able to bring together five panelists and a facilitator to talk about what it means to be a disabled archaeologist, whether in the laboratory, out in the field, or behind the scenes in museums, these archaeologists will discuss their experiences in 90 short minutes. Today's discussion will be moderated by Zooarchaeology PhD student at Cardiff University, Hannah Peugeot. We'll open up for audience Q&A after the conversation, the initial conversation, but feel free to submit your questions at any time in the Q&A box on the Zoom toolbar. The Q&A does go by very quickly. So please help us answer as many questions as possible by submitting your questions if you have them. And if your question is for someone specific, please let us know when you submit it. If you would prefer to remain anonymous, just check the box before you submit. Please note that closed captions are available by clicking the arrow text on the closed caption button on the Zoom toolbar. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to Hannah and our panelists. With that, I will turn it over to Hannah to introduce our panel. Prenhaba, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm from Wales. As Chris has said, my name is Hannah Pejo, and I'm a zooarchaeologist out of Cardiff University, which means I'm coming to you, like I said, from Wales today. Um, I myself am a disabled academic and educator. Before I introduce everyone, I just want to make an important note about the conversation we're going to be having today. While it is important to listen and take note of everything said by the present panel, it is equally important to note that every disabled person is going to have individual needs and preferences. What we say today has to be taken in with the knowledge that the majority of us are survivors within this system. <clears throat> We are privileged to have done so. We represent a wide variety of intersecting life experiences, disabilities, and geographic locations, but intersecting marginalizations, especially though for those who are Black or Indigenous or may not have access to support systems because they are migrants, um, are going to be even more heavily affected and often have their identity erased in these situations. That being said, I'd like to continue on to our introductions. Um, I will be going around my screen, just so you know that it, this is sort of in order from the way I'm seeing it. I apologize if that is not for the same for the rest of you. So first is Alex Fitzpatrick, PhD out of the University of Bradford. Um, and then we have Amelia Dahl, who is a deaf archeologist who works for the Bureau of Land Management. Next, we have Bill Archer, um, who is an archeologist and historian. Then we have Cheryl Fogel Hatch, who is the founder of the Museum of Senses, and Allison Blank, who is a grad student at the University of Arizona. I spun right past the questions. Um, so if everyone just wants to go around and say hello, we can start with Alex. Do you want to give her? Hi, everyone. As Hannah introduced me. I'm uh, Alex Fitzpatrick. I am also a zoo archaeologist currently at the University of Bradford, working primarily as an EDI researcher. Um, and I'm, I guess, newly disabled. So we'll be having a very interesting uh, perspective on this conversation in comparison maybe to some of my panelists. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here, especially as I'm a huge fan of everyone who's currently on this panel and their amazing work, basically, you know, moving this progress forward for people like me who are in the process of realizing we have 
disabling conditions and without their work we would be left to the wayside so that's just for me amelia was there anything you wanted to say as a quick little intro yeah hi my name is amelia doll uh, my sign name is as such so i'm an archaeologist for the bureau of land management um, i just started that job in july roughly around july um, I am deaf, obviously, and yeah, since I've been deaf since, deaf since birth, and yeah, I don't really know any other way other than just being deaf. So yeah, I grew up, um, you know, in a signing community, my whole family. Um, I went to a deaf, uh, deaf, deaf residential school. I have um, hearing brothers and um, some siblings, but yeah, I've just, I'm a deaf person through and through. I have deaf family. Um, yeah, but I'm deaf in addition to being an archaeologist. So yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge. This field is not always accessible. Um, so yeah, I'm just really excited about this panel and I'm really looking forward to um, just moving forward in this field and, and just starting to kind of mobilize, mobilize archaeology as, a, you know, as an accessible field. So I'm just really looking forward to everything everyone has to say. And yeah, nice to meet you all. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Amelia. Bill, did you want to add anything? Hi, I'm, I'm Bill, and again, and um, I'm I'm an archaeologist historian because I've been uh, out of professional context. I was a contract archaeologist until May of 2019, uh, when my condition um, came forward, uh, which has made uh, physical activity and uh, long long term mental. Uh, processes uh, difficult for me. Um, so uh, paid work uh, sort of fell off the thing. But uh, during the past two some odd years, I have tried various projects uh, online uh, from YouTube to podcast to Twitter, which is the most consistent, um, to stay within archaeology, uh, within history, and, and to be an advocate for both uh, archaeology uh, and uh, the disabled community uh, with that. So that's that's sort of where I'm sitting right now. Okay, and Cheryl, you are next. Did you want to add anything? Hello, everyone. As Santa said, I'm Cheryl Fogel Hatch. I am currently mostly in the museum accessibility space, but I do still uh, do some avocational uh, work in archaeology and do still monitor. Uh, access to archaeology, I more actively monitor access to the sciences generally. I did my PhD at the University of New Mexico, and I did a study of stone projectile points, and they were involved museum collections. And we can talk about uh, alternative techniques and other things as we go along. Thanks. And last but certainly not least, um, Allison, did you have anything you wanted to add before we uh, learn from intros? Yeah, uh, so hi everybody. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I am a current graduate student getting my MA at the University of Arizona. Um, I am a classical archaeologist, so I work in a very niche area of archaeology, um, but just as important to make all areas of archaeology accessible. Um, doesn't matter where in the world we study, we should be able to access those sites regardless. Um, so I am a service dog handler and I identify as autistic and disabled. And I'm just really excited to get to talk to everybody today and answer some questions and see what comes of this very monumental discussion. Brilliant. Um, so just as a slight introduction to myself, because I didn't really give one, um, I identify as neurodivergent and disabled. Um, she, they pronouns, either is fine. I will not be upset if someone uses one over the other. Um, and other than that, I think it's time to get into our questions. We had a nice, nice little 10 minute intro there. Perfect timing. Um, so now that we've introduced ourselves, um, I want to start off with some of our more simple questions that a lot of these early questions have come from our panelists, like things we wanted to get to just get things going. Um, but again, the Q&A will be open the whole time. And while we have some questions prepped, we definitely want to be able to tailor it also to those of you viewing. So please definitely do send in any questions you have. We have, if you see me looking over, that's because I am reading questions off of our question list, <laughs> not because I am uh, staring at the dog who is snoring in the background and I apologize if you can hear him. 
Um, so let's start off with something that Alex brought up in our emails. Um, so what are some things that archaeologists can do right now to make their work more accessible? And I will note that I'm asking this question outside of the context of COVID because we do have a few COVID specific <laughs> questions that I think can can lead from this. But let's start more in general. What are just like baseline things that people can do right now? I know I can say for one, um, one of the things I do when I teach is, and I know some people won't like this, but I have stopped free speaking basically when I do lectures. Now that's not possible in seminars, but when I lecture, I now read off of a script almost as if I was at a conference because that way I have a transcript to immediately provide for my students. Because one of the problems I have being an early career researcher and being someone who is not staff <laughs> and not treated as staff, which presents its own problems that we could do a whole different panel about, <laughs> is that I don't have access to all of the same captioning tools through Panopto and things like that. Um, so instead of doing lectures on the fly or just like how I've always done, I moved to basically a conference model so that yes, it's can't do this with seminars because that's about conversation, but it has made my lectures more accessible to students. And that's not just about disability. That is also important for people who might have to, you know, take watch their lectures at they're on their break at work and things like that. So you will find a lot of crossover in anything we bring up with other marginalized identities being helped those ways. Does anybody else have any baseline stuff that they've done or find really helpful? Well, the baseline that I always say giving, giving any disability awareness presentation to any group is if you don't know something, it's okay to ask. Don't assume. Uh, we all know what assuming is, um, and it should start a conversation if you ask what someone's preference is or what they find helpful. And that would avoid some of the ignorances and stupidities that um, come up if people just assume you can't do XYZ task or you haven't problem solved X, Y, Z task because I, I imagine most of us probably have solved many of them or have a process in place that we use to problem solve that you as a non-disabled archaeologist interacting with us are completely unaware of. So why don't Amelia and Allison, I think you would be really good to comment in on this, especially since you have very different needs than most people being deaf and a service dog user, and those provide very unique baselines. Um, so Amelia or Allison, do one of you want to comment on it first, or do either of you want Amelia to Amelia has been waiting, so please, yes. Amelia, go ahead. Amelia can go. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I do want to echo um, what Hannah and Cheryl just mentioned. I mean, I myself mostly, you know, I work with non-disabled people and they don't typically realize that we as a disabled population, we already have those scripts ready. We already have that awareness. We already know what to do when interacting with other folks. You know, for example, as you know, interacting with people who can hear, knowing how to interact with those hearing folks, I already have that too. I already have that in the back of my mind. I have a script ready that I'm ready to use. Um, and as what Cheryl said, I totally agree. You know, please ask me questions. I already have that script ready. You know, what kind of answer I can provide to you, what kind of materials you will need, um, just kind of knowing what you will want to know, being able to provide those resources and provide just kind of that beneficial information so that we can go along, you know, we can work together easily. And sometimes people, I think, fear asking. Uh, they think that it's rude or it's impolite to ask those questions. Um, and I, I don't think, I think it's more rude if you don't ask and if you do base it off assumptions. So yeah, as Cheryl said, I think it's so important to just open that dialogue, ask those questions and say, you know, do we need to make this situation any more accessible? How can we make it better for you? I'm um, just making sure that there's, yeah, an interactive conversation happening. 
I absolutely agree. That is one of my biggest conversation pieces for people who don't understand why disabled people want to be a part of dis a, a part of archaeology and academia in general, and why we need some support and understanding and respect from the non-disabled people around us. Um, and it's really difficult sometimes to deal with those assumptions. Um, there's so many assumptions about every single type of disability out there almost. There's always going to be some preconceived notions that we have to work up against. But like Amelia said, we, 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 we deal with that regularly. We already know what's coming. Um, and I think for me, with um, having a service dog, something that is very unusual, um, and most of the people that I interact with have never even met a service dog before, um, being able to answer those questions without having to overcome that baseline assumption makes my world a um, hundred times easier. If I have to Com convince somebody oh no I can do this oh I I, I promise you I know what I'm, I'm I know what I what I need here um then my life becomes a lot more difficult um and I have to exert more energy trying to tell somebody no that's wrong here's what the correct thing is versus being able to just tell them what I need in the first place um so that's one of my um strongest suggestions I, I presented on this recently um, at the SAA um, for field schools, especially um, wanting to um, encourage and um, invite more disabled um, students and archaeologists onto their field site is to be aware of the many different possibilities of what our needs may be and be open to having that conversation with us rather than telling us we can't do this we only have this option um, let us make that decision i did um a similar actually amelia was involved in some of the question making for when i when i did this um survey a few years ago um for the eaas but i did it on i focused mostly on conferences and conference attendance which was a this was like when me and amelia first met on twitter um and almost everything was just like please just add a box for us to tell you what we need like that was 90 percent of the respondents were just like please just give us a box we just need a box and yeah we have lots to say if you'll just listen <laughs> we have lots to say if you just ask us and so we've seen some really good well not not good strides with the eaas unfortunately that became a different fight for different conversation that I had with them two years ago where they um, started not allowing posters um, anymore for volunteers, which is classes and ableists in a very different way, but I don't want to get too much into that. Um, and we've seen some, um, not universities, organizations make very good strides. So Liz Quinlan made very good strides with the SHAs um, when she was helping when that, uh, that was last year, I want to say might have been two years ago now. Time in COVID doesn't exist. So it's, I think it was two, might have been two SAJs ago now that we're past the normal SAJ time of the year. Um, but there was a good direct question related to this directly to me from Marissa Lopez. So the question is, do I record my seminars for transcription? <clears throat> I I'm very lucky that where I currently work right now, I only work under um, professors who have given me access to who needs what in my courses. I do not record the current seminar I am teaching because my students have said they do not need it. Um, and a few of them indicated they might've been uncomfortable being recorded so because I was the only one who would have needed a transcript because of my chronic pain and migraines. Sometimes I do need to not listen to people. I need to read things, but obviously I am the one speaking in these seminars. Um, so I do not record my current seminars, but if a student needed that, that is something I would do. Um, and I do think people should do, especially if 
you have student, a lot of students who are even out because again, a lot of this intersects with other problems, especially things like if someone is a carer for a disabled parent um, and you know, and has to miss a seminar or something. I think recording is good, even though I do not do it in my current class because my students have indicated they would prefer not to. Um, and I think that's a good segue into is Bill, I think, who asked the COVID specific question. So how has COVID added specific challenges to you in person, to your in-person and virtual work managing your disability? And I wanna kind of tack on to the end of that and what other things has it opened up or shown that we really could be doing to, to add to that baseline that you know people were telling us wasn't there, but was clearly always there. I mean, this, <laughs> this. <laughs> um, I think these, <laughs> these <laughs> webinars themselves are, I know for me, have been really exciting to be able to attend lectures all over the world. And, and we see how easily, maybe not easily, but how it is definitely possible to make these types of public facing events happen in a truly public and accessible way, like having them on a Zoom meeting where people can join from wherever is accessible for them, like having captioning, like having ASL interpretation, um, all of those things. I think the pandemic is, has shown us that we have these opportunities, that we should take advantage of them and that we should be doing this and holding these events and talking about these topics whenever we can. I have to say, as someone who had to go off of the medication that kept her functioning in April of last year, very suddenly, um, because the NHS has just decided that they disagree with all of my American doctors, which is a really fun situation to be in. And another thing you have to consider when you are an academic, especially one that travels, like many archeologists do, um, that the ability to have things online um, and that accessibility has been like, was game changing for me because instead of being really isolated, living alone in a foreign country that I moved to, cause I've never lived in Cardiff before. I've only lived in London and Manchester. Um, none of my friend base is here. They're all in England or Scotland. And so it was really, really helpful on that. And as well, which, you know, mental health is still part of the disability sphere, especially for those of us who are neurodivergent like myself. And so having that accessibility that isn't often considered an accessibility because we don't often think of mental health as a part of this package and we really need to and we should, um, I can say that it was an absolute game changer for me. And it really has, like you said, shown that we could have always been doing this. Um, I mean, Skype really missed out on a huge market that they already had that they just weren't tapping into, um, which is, yeah, I could see Amelia's reaction just like, why did Skype not do this? But now we have, you know, like Microsoft Teams and Zoom, and there's really no reason for us to not fight the backpedaling that's going on. So Amelia, you had a very wide reaction. Did you want to, to say something? <laughs> Well, so I, ju I just feel like the pandemic did really help accessibility. Yeah, it, it did and it did not at the same time for me. And the reason I say that is just because before the pandemic, um, it was a lot harder to say, hey, you know, I need an interpreter. It was a lot harder to say, explain, you know, turn on the closed captioning. I mean, all of those things were much more of a challenge pre-pandemic, but at the same time, if it was, you know, so accessible in this day and age, why wouldn't we be providing more ASL interpreters with, without having to be asked? Why isn't that just, you know, automatically turn on captions as opposed to waiting to be asked? You know, in events or different things where they're announcing, hey, you know, we have this really cool archaeology event, um, but it doesn't include, does it have any accessibility features? So then I end up having to do the work to ask and ask and 
and ask and advocate for those things. And sometimes that's exhausting. And like the pandemic, everything is virtual. So having to ask for all of those things, I mean, it's like 20 or 30 times a month where I'm like, hey, is this going to be accessible to me? Some people say, oh, we didn't find anyone available. This is not accessible. Or maybe they'll, they'll ask me, how do I do that? Or how do I do the caption? So then the onus is on me to help them. It's my time and my energy to help them figure out how to provide those accessibility services to these events. And wow, I mean, that's just time consuming and an incredibly, it just, it's incredibly time consuming. You know, it's more, more so than it used to be, I would say. Um, you know, just because of how everyone is, you know, used to these virtual events at this, at this point, I don't know, it's a yes and no, I feel half and half it is, but I'm an optimistic person. And so I think looking forward, it will only get better, you know, events like today's event, you know, we never have had anything like this, I don't feel like. So hopefully moving forward, it's better. And I'm hopeful about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just really think that, I mean, Skype, they had that technology a long time ago, and you're right, and they missed out. <laughs> Missed out. Missed out. Um, so I've been asked another direct question that kind of leads into, I do agree with Amelia. There's definitely been pluses and minuses. I think on the whole, it's really expanded the what we know is possible. Um, but there's a question from Julia, and I'm sorry if I say your last name wrong. I think it's Milliken. <laughs> um, how do you get recordings slash other accommodations to specific students if there isn't really a mechanism in place to do that? Is it email? Um, because sometimes things are rather large files. So that's one of those things where you get into the catch-22 of that really depends on your institution. So for me, when we record anything, I can upload it. If I record, say I make a voice recording on my iPad while I'm teaching, because part of my coping mechanism with being neurodivergent is that the iPad never leaves me when I'm doing um, anything like this or teaching because I take notes on it. I read off of it. Um, the ADHD medication alone is not enough to keep me focused because I am not on a high enough dose. <laughs> so I always have the iPad with me. So I, it is easy for me to record. And Cardiff University and most universities, um, Alex, I don't know, is Bradford Panopto as well? You don't know. <laughs> you weren't teaching anymore when, when it got to the pandemic. So um, most of the UK was using Panopto. And Panopto, you could pre-record videos and upload to. So you were just then sharing links. And so basically you were recording everything for a time being because Wales was on a hard lockdown. Um, so I did not teach the year that we were on a hard lockdown. So I didn't have seminars that year that I would have been recording and I was only recording lectures. Um, and those all went on to Panopto. Um, other options are you can have a closed YouTube channel for a class if the files are very big. Um, I found that, that that has worked in the past when I was a when I was, well, this is a throwback, when I was still working as a journalist a very long time ago, um, if I did interviews and I needed to share them with an editor or something, we would put them on private YouTube channels and you can do that. Um, but most institutions currently at least have some form of way to upload things or should, because most institutions had at least some online presence. Um, if not, PowerPoint is really your best way to go because PowerPoint has a lot of built in features. The transcription also isn't terrible on PowerPoint. It's not great um, for site names, but it's right more than you would think it is. Um, so I work in Scotland on the, the Western Isles on the Hebrides in particular. Um, it does not get my site names correctly. I will not say them now because I did not did not think I was going to be talking about my work, but it is a good example because um, like Bornish, which I do not expect to be spelled correctly by a lovely uh, live transcriptionist, very close, very close. It just doesn't have an H on the end. But um, so my sites just never get said correct, like uh, done correctly on those. But PowerPoint is very, very good otherwise and has a lot of internal features and just smaller um, final sizes. Did anybody have anything they wanted to add about that with like workarounds, Amelia? Yeah, I did just want to add, 
um, PowerPoint also has a um, picture in picture feature where you can have a video within a PowerPoint. Um, and so you can have an interpreter or a signer or some sort of video playing, um, you know, while a, a PowerPoint slide is going. So that picture in picture in feature um, is available. Yeah, to just have an interpreter or video um, accessible. And then you can upload that to YouTube um, and then it will do the automated caption, which that is a, you know, kind of a crapshoot, but it's better than nothing, but you can do that picture in picture. And usually deaf people typically, you know, will have to look at those auto captions and typically, you know, we, we figure it out in our own way, you know, figuring out, okay, that word is not right or it's spelled wrong or, okay, I can assume by the context of what's being said and the whole conversation, I can figure out what that word or, or, you know, what was, what was just said um, based on, you know, the captioning, you know, and, and I know professors had done that in the past and it's okay. It's not bad, um, but it's just, yeah, something that, that we all have been doing. Um, so, Bill, and then I'll ask Alex, have there been, especially because Alex vivid during all of this, um, during becoming disabled and, and the pandemic. So, Bill, as someone who's had to leave the field and then immediately got stuck in a pandemic, um, what things have you found that have helped you? Because I know you also asked this question, so I wanted to get to you specifically, like, <laughs> as a speaker here. Well, yeah, no, no, I, I sort of like was priming myself for the uh, question, you know, you put questions in so you can get asked them. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I'd already been sort of home um, dealing with uh, this um, functional neurological disorder uh, for almost a year. Uh, but when it hit and the lockdowns came into place, I saw all of my archaeological friends also now all of a sudden finding themselves at home. Um, and, you know, from reading, you know, conversations online, it looked like uh, some of their, uh, you know, it was affecting some folks' mental health and, and such, you know, you're being locked home all of a sudden. Um, so I had been working around an idea of trying to do some uh, outreach online. Um, so I sent out some emails to people and uh, put together a couple live YouTube events of archaeologists, um, you know, panel events of how you're doing with the pandemic, um, either as a group or individual grad students, or I would do news of the week. Um, and that lasted until my condition got a little worse and it was harder uh, to put those things together. And uh, I set up a uh, little discord servers for sort of to play around with uh, Archeo gaming um, and those types of things that still lives on uh, with the Archeo Gaming Collective, even though I'm not really participating with them right now. Um, so it was a lot of trying to start a lot of things to keep myself and archeologists busy during this time period when we were all being shut down and so forth. And it also opened my eyes to the potential uh, for electronic media, for virtual media uh, to get to publics. I mean, this focus initially was on uh, archaeologists, and I think that's important too. Uh, we have to remember archaeologists as an audience um, uh, with ourselves. We were able to talk to ourselves a lot more uh, than we had done in the past. Um, but these tools also enable us to talk to publics um, as well. And that's uh, more critical. And as always, we can do better uh, with that. And um, part of my rehab is to try to get back into doing more of these things uh, more often, but uh, I'm always planning. Um, so that's, that's where I am. So Alex, especially as someone who, you know, I know that your physical problems really started to manifest, unfortunately, right, when you were planning on vibing. Um, how has this mixture of, you know, the baseline we already knew was there and COVID accessibility measures, how did that help you in that process? Because I know there's Definitely. I know for me, I um, still want the option of a digital vibe, even though I know my school is going to say no. Um, but there are definitely people out there right now who are actively vibing this year who definitely probably have questions about that type of accessibility. So, oh, I mean, I loved it. It was <laughs> great. It's the best thing to happen to me. Uh, no, it's, I mean, the pandemic is not a good thing to happen to anyone, but 
in terms of accessibility and it, it just kind of worked out for me. So when I started my PhD all the way in 2016, uh, I actually, around the time I started, I got diagnosed with a uh, anxiety disorder and with chronic depression. Uh, I had a bit of a nervous breakdown at the start of my PhD. And then uh, somewhat ironically, at the end of my PhD is where uh, I started to experience really severe chronic pain and have am currently in the process of getting a diagnosis uh, for my joint disorder, uh, which is making mobility very difficult. So oddly enough, the kind of switch to digital was really handy for me in terms of being able to work from the comfort of my home, where fortunately I was privileged enough to have good Wi-Fi, access to all of my materials. I don't live that far from the university that I did my PhD. And I had loads of friends and colleagues who were willing to help out either by taking photos of things at the lab that I couldn't reach, especially when lockdown was a little bit eased up. I had friends and colleagues who would drop off stuff to my house because I couldn't drive or you know, get there. So I, I'm very lucky and very privileged in a lot of ways that I was able to successfully uh, work in these conditions. And I think that's an aspect of it as well. And it's something that we've talked about in terms of that survivorship bias, you know, not everyone has access to those things. So for me personally, the switch to digital for my Viva was great for my mental health, for you know dealing with the anxiety of it, for the fact that I was able to sit down and do my Viva, which was huge. I really struggle with my knees right now uh, with my chronic pain. And, but the thing is that I also had that support network as well. And I don't know if I would have done as well, even with the kind of switch to digital and the accommodations that come with that, um, if I didn't have that support network to also help me. And I think that's something we need to think about in terms of accommodations. It can't just be and I don't want to make it sound like I'm not, that these things aren't important. It's really useful to have kind of these platform accommodations. Like I said, the switch to digital, things like that. You also need the support system to help disabled archeologists uh, as well. Otherwise, you know, what are the accommodations for if you're not also making sure we have the you know, the mental health uh, uh, support that we need. Because I think, you know, as a disabled archeologist, mentally, it, it is very difficult as well, even without my various mental illnesses and disorders, it, it can be very isolating, especially if you're say the only disabled archeologist, if you know, you're dealing with ableism, whether or not it's conscious or otherwise from uh, your coworkers and your colleagues. And I think that happens sometimes where, you know, people just don't think about it and it happens and you're just reminded, oh, I'm in a field that isn't ne wasn't necessarily built for people like me. And I think uh, for some of us who have other marginalized identities, you know, it, that can be compacted. So that support network during this pandemic has been so helpful. And also just meeting people digitally in uh, events like this who have very similar kind of conditions or you know face similar types of marginalization has been really really helpful and useful for someone like me who's just kind of entering this world of you know disability so um and i'm going to move to a question from debbie sneed I hope I said Debbie's last name right. I realize I talked to Debbie enough that I should know her, how to say her last name, but I'm sorry if I did not. Um, and after this question, I want to move on from accommodations because often these panels end up 150% about accommodations. And I do not, we do not only want to talk about that today because that is, that is again, I use the word baseline here because accommodations are the start. That is the simple thing you should be doing. And that's why I think Debbie's question is actually a really good question to end this kind of sort of questioning and then move on to other questions, um, probably about actually working in the field because we have several about those, including from our audience. So Debbie has said, thanks so much to everyone on this groundbreaking, 
if I could talk correct, uh, well, that would help. Uh, groundbreaking panel, pun intended. Um, I am a non-disabled archaeologist, and I notice in talking with other non-disabled archaeologists that they often think that accommodating disabled people will be too difficult or expensive for an archaeological project. Obviously, this is not true, but I am wondering if you could give some examples of either small or big accommodations that have been helpful for you on, on a project. And that was, this is part of why I wanted to have this as our jumping off. And I know Amelia and Allison are definitely going to want to talk about this one. Um, questions, because this is very fieldwork specific instead of being, you know, outreach, museum, and classroom specific, which is a lot of what the other um, discussions we've had so far have um, focused on. I'd, anyway, to finish the question, so what has been helpful on an actual archaeological project, and it is helpful to know if you haven't really needed specific accommodations or if what you needed was also used by non-disabled archaeologists. Um, so that kind of um, tags back to something I brought up a few times as well, like, you know, if someone's a carer for a parent or has to watch their lectures on their break from work because they don't ha they have to support themselves you know a lot of these things do tie into other people so that i think that's a very good point to bring up especially because you know the cross section of marginalized identities often gets erased when we're talking about um disability and vice versa um so amelia would you like to go first because you were very empathetic <laughs> Yeah, and that was just because, I mean, that question I know many people are so concerned about. Um, and so, yeah, there's not a lot of people that realize, um, yeah, that there are grants available. Um, you know, there's grant funding available to utilize for disabled people if they need support in any way, if they need accommodations, et cetera. They have grants and, and money set aside that are available to that. So if an organization puts in, you know, a proposal, then they can get granted fund that for that, for interpreters, for transcription, or whatever accommodation. But a lot of people don't realize that those grants are available. Um, you know, and being deaf, I do have specific kinds of, you know, they have specific funding for deaf accommodations specifically. Um, but the bottom line is is, I mean, time. I think people tend to be unwilling to give up their time to actually apply for a grant or do those types of specific funding requests. And so that's where the problem is, in my opinion. Um, you know, and I understand, you know, that that time is a lot, but when people put that burden onto me, when I have my job, I have everything that I already have on my plate, and then, you know, I want to go, but I can't because they don't have the funding, despite the fact that they could have gone and sought out that funding to make sure that I could go and access that. So sometimes I do feel like the burden becomes on the disabled community, on me specifically, and I think that that burden needs to be, you know, accepted and, and yeah, just the organization needs to honor that burden and roll up their sleeves to start making sure they're they're applying for grant funding. I mean, there's plenty of it out there. And so I think the onus is really on those organizations and for people to take the time to look. I, I can add on to that. I absolutely agree. I think that's a, an incredibly important point. There's, there's definitely a lot of, maybe not a lot, but there is funding available if you go out and look for it. And the same thing is true with a lot of other things that are helpful for not just us as disabled archaeologists, but anyone digging on, um, on, on a site, having accessible tools or tools that are adaptable or having um, designated areas for people with different needs. Like I know for myself, I can't dig in a super deep pit where I have to climb in and out with a ladder that's not something that's really accessible for me because of my service dog. If he needs to alert me to something, he can't do that. Um, so I need to dig in lower trenches. Um, but there are also many other people, like people get injured on site. People have different um, flexibility or size needs um, where they may not be able to fit in that tiny little hole over there. There's probably somebody on site who can. Um, that's one of my... Um, uh, other suggestions is to remember that there are all types of different bodies on a field site, all types of different abilities that are needed on a field site or in a lab or in a department. Um, there are activities and 
um, maybe not activities, that's not quite the right word, but um, techniques, I guess, is maybe the more the right word that can be beneficial for a variety of different bodies. So I think those are really important things to consider is that, like um, Debbie pointed out, is that accommodations aren't only useful for us, they can be useful for everyone on site. But it is also important to think about what's useful for us specifically. <laughs> um, so I think knowing that there is a balance there and that there are so many different conversations that could be had as a part of that. Um, and there's so many different accommodations that somebody might need. This goes back to the other question we were talking about where the, the best thing to do is always just ask, allow the disabled person to have that space to say, here's what I need. Here's, here's what would be best for me. Let's have a conversation about that. Um, yes. Yeah, so and I have found just just specifically comment on that, that like a lot of people think that it's going to be big accommodation. And honestly, most accommodations are relatively small and people overcomplicate them. Um, so like in my example, being also physically disabled and not the same way that Allison is, but in a similar way, because um, I have joint issues, I have, I have muscular issues. Um, climbing up and down a ladder is possible for me some days. And I will tell you if I can that day, I will tell you if I cannot. And sometimes it's just about learning how to go with the flow, which is something us as archeologists or any archeologist should know how to do anyway. Because if your trench is full of water, you've got to go with that. So why can't you go with the fact that I maybe can't climb down the ladder some days, but some days I can. Um, Bill, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, I want to sort of talk about this from the sort of, well, I'm from commercial, uh, the world of commercial archaeology. So it's from the world of the management perspective, the, the people who write the proposals and try to get these things in place, because I've done a few of these. And um, Amelia's right, uh, time is the biggest uh, reason accommodations are not made, um, because uh, for the most part, it's, it's an act of omission. Um, it, it could be malice omission, uh, but it's still omission. Um, for, for an even amount there. Um, also, if you know small commercial archaeology, uh, they're notorious for crying poverty and being the, some of the uh, cheapest people in town. So trying to get a new shovel for the most able-bodied person on site is a chore, let alone an accommodation uh, for someone who may need uh, specialty equipment uh, for that. Uh, typically, the way they can work around that is to have um, an understanding uh, field director or crew chief. Uh, those are always uh, some of the best, the ones in the field, um, because most accommodations can be improvised. Um, like you're saying, if you can't, if you are, today you can't climb down the ladder, cool, we'll get somebody else to climb down the ladder. Uh, a lot of the accommodations can be done that, but there are bigger bigger ones, you're talking about that ones with the grants. And unfortunately, I know at least from the smaller firms, they are not taking advantage of these um, opportunities. Um, so, so there is plenty of work to be done. And it's just, this is accessibility across the board um, for people who need to maybe have days off to take care of uh, uh, disabled uh, uh, gloved ones. Um, it can be very hard where you say, I need to be off every Thursday to take some of the therapy, they won't hire you. They're gonna move on to the next person. Um, so it's commercial is a, can be a cutthroat business for everybody and especially for the disabled. I, I know I was most likely already with my condition for the last year before I got out, it was basically the, the head portion of my condition. Uh, with the headaches, the fog, and the um, occasional slurring of speech and things like that hadn't really come yet. Uh, it was just the pain. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm an older man in, in archaeology who uh, expects to, uh, pain is part of the job. Pain is what you do. If you're not living with pain every day, you're not an archaeologist. You don't cry about the pain, you endure the pain which is some of the most toxic 
idiotic concepts that that there are out, that are out there and need to be flushed from the industry possible this sort of toxic masculinity which i've seen presented by many women in the field as well uh needs to be flushed out oh yeah not... i just want to say that some of the <laughs> yeah. most the most people who play into toxic masculinity the, what would or what we would consider toxic masculinity the most are archaeologists who are uh, who are field directors who identify as women who think that they need to be like that to like be the big boss in charge. Yeah. Field works about collecting data. It's not about proving your physical aptitude. So I, I, I will now step down from my soapbox and drink some more water. <laughs> I will listen to you on a soapbox all day long. I completely agree. <laughs> I think there's, uh, oh, and I just forgot my point. Um, Ah, shoot. Go, Amelia. Yeah, I did want to add um, just one what Allison was saying. And I also wanted to ask, I mean, yeah, I think that you're right, that people should be asking us what we need, those accommodations. Yes, I completely agree that that should be asked. But at the same time, reminding ourselves that when we ask that person, um, you know, a disabled person, if they're, are they young? You know, will they understand or will they be able to really know um, about what the, you know, what accommodations specifically they need? Just because, I mean, this is my own personal experience. When I was an undergrad student at Gallaudet University, they had paid for my field work, or excuse me, they had paid for my field school. Um, I was so excited, um, Gallaudet and um, the other program, the research program, they did go ahead and ask me, they said, do you need an ASL interpreter? And I did look at them and I thought, no, no, I actually, I don't think I need an interpreter. I'll be okay. You know, because what I envisioned, I thought, okay, this, this will be fine. Just what I had envisioned. I thought we're just going to be at a dig site. We're just, you know, lecture is going to be pretty minimal. It uh, won't be a big deal. I thought, yeah, I think the, the ASL interpreter wouldn't really be utilized, but really, I mean, they were having lectures every evening, all, all day people are talking and I felt so completely lost. And this was a three week program. And I just felt incredibly lost. And I, I mean, that was probably 20, I was probably, yeah, in my twenties at that time, you know, I'm 30 now. So, you know, at that age, you know, my young 20s, early 20s, I mean, maybe I was a little bit feeling, you know, okay, I have my deaf identity, I don't need an interpreter, I don't need to rely on anyone, deafness doesn't, you know, I don't need an interpreter, I don't want someone to follow me around, I can, you know, write back and forth, and so maybe I was a bit brash about my deaf identity, I wasn't really accepting of that, or I don't know, thought that it would be no big deal, but when I was in that situation, I was dumb, I mean, I, I grew up, I went to deaf residential schools, I went to Gallaudet University, which is a deaf, you know, university, um, you know, there's hearing teachers, but mostly, you know, everyone signs. So from two to 21, from two to 21 years old, I mean, I was in deaf programs and that's a long time, you know, and that's a long time to be in the deaf community, deaf culture. And so I think I just, you know, being in those deaf spaces my entire life, I figured that field school would be no problem. And it was, it was a problem. And I was so alone. I felt so isolated. My roommate, you know, could sign just by luck of the draw that she was my roommate, you know, very sweet. She would interpret for me so kind, but it was not her role to interpret. She was supposed to be there working as well. She was supposed to be there as a participant, not as an interpreter. And I really felt badly putting that burden on her to, you know, provide accessibility to me. And that was really, that was my first encounter that, you know, that I was involved in a hearing and a hearing, you know, 24 seven community, working, living, breathing 24 seven, you know, typically if I was going to a hearing environment, you know, for eight hours per week, that would be different because I go home to my deaf family, but I was in a hearing space 24 seven and I realized that I needed an interpreter and I, I, you know, for all of those things, and I did ask for the accommodation, but it really, I mean, it was a little bit late, you know, I said, yeah, can I actually take the accommodation, you know, can you guys work something out with the costs and, and make sure that this gets taken care of. Um, so I, I just think for myself, I just, I, I don't feel badly anymore for getting those accommodations because, you know, and I know, you know, you have to pay the interpreter to be with me for three weeks. That's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of money, you know, providing interpreting services an expensive thing. And so, you know, just having that internal conflict of, is that okay for me? You know, is that okay to ask that? You know, and I always think, oh, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. But really in that situation, I was not fine. I really needed that accommodation. Um, so I think, you know, 
having those accommodations available, not being concerned about financials, um, and just making sure that I have what I need to take the yeah, to take on that program. Um, so I think this plays really well into moving on to the conversation about jobs because we've had several conversations about jobs and there's still going to be a lot of, you know, accessibility talk in this, but, you know, more focused on the jobs because I can say like my experience along um, working in commercial archaeology means I cannot go back to commercial archaeology because there's always that person in the I had very good crew directors, um, uh, crew chiefs, sorry, very bad field directors on both of the, all of the field work I did in Texas. Um, like my experience, my crew chief was like, yeah, you're having a rough afternoon after lunch, your knees working up, you know what, we will have you move the truck along the side of the highway and you can come and get, because I was having a problem, you know, getting up and down off of my knees, getting out of um, our uh, STPs. And uh, the crew chief was fine with that. I was helping somebody needed to move the truck. So why not have me move the truck and, you know, take people's field sheets from them and keep things organized. And the field director lost it that he was letting me like not dig STPs and fired me that day and claimed it was because I injured myself on the job, which I didn't. Um, so we've had this come up in a few questions, you know, um, uh, read Ellison. Frank, I hope I said the first part of your last name, last name correctly, um, asked about, you know, disclosure. Um, we have had Julia Milliken um, ask also about, you know, when do you feel unreasonable or not? And I think those two um, questions tie really well into each other because, you know, there is always this battle between when do I disclose and then how much do I ask for once I disclose? or do I disclose first, or do I do it all at once, or do I not disclose until I need it, or do I disclose immediately after getting hired, or do I disclose during an interview, um, and I can say for myself, that changes per job, per situation, because I have to get the vibe of a company or a person first, so there are jobs where I have disclosed in my email to them like hey I saw that you were doing this it's just lab work I am disabled but I won't need any accommodations because I I know what your facilities are and I know I'll be fine you know other than I might need to sit down every now and then but everybody has usually lab work I'm able to get a chair that's not a problem um but there are definitely interviews I have gone into where I did not disclose either prior or during um including my current PhD program, because I did not know anybody at Cardiff. Um, and so I did not disclose until after I had already been accepted because it should not have affected the work I was going to be doing because I'm doing database work and I didn't need to do field work. So the majority of my accommodations were gonna be things that I needed in the office. Like I need an ergonomic chair, which they paid for. Um, <laughs> and things like that. And those were things that would not affect my ability to do my project. And so I did not disclose immediately. Um, the, has anybody, does anybody have any big feelings on yeah. you know, disclosure when and where? I know Amelia, it's probably very different for you and Cheryl, it's probably very different for you um, given that mm -hmm. the, the nature of your um, more obvious- It's a, a parent, yes. Disabilities. Yes. Um, are very different than like chronic pain, you know, or like even, you know, Ellis Danlos where, you know, you know, there are situations where I'm fine and I don't need to tell this person sometimes. Um, obviously with the service dog is a little different with the EDS, but you know, so Cheryl, you haven't spoken in quite a while. So would you want to comment first? I can. And yes, I have disclosed as soon as I have walked into a room. I happen to be blind. I use a white cane. It is pretty obvious. Um, I have chosen to work for myself for a number of years, largely to avoid those employer, employee, interviewee uh, conundrums. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that too. It's, uh, it's very obvious to people when I walk in with a giant 80 pound dog that there's something going on. Um, so I found for myself personally that it's it's easier for me to just be an open book and say, here's what's happening. Let me tell you all about it. If you have any questions, now is the time. And then I've, I've, I 
usually don't have to deal with that as as it comes up people are like oh right okay this is probably something connected to this slew of issues that that she's already told me about but i don't want to make it sound like that is a necessity for everybody because of course everybody's needs are different everybody's disabilities are different there are different um um like i said preconceived notions that people have about <laughs> a variety of different things um and i know for me i i don't present like the six-year-old autistic boy who lives next door to the man who doesn't understand that i as an adult woman can be autistic too um so i already there's some things that people don't understand when they meet me or need to understand when they have to un like uh, sorry <laughs> Uh, there are already things that people are confused about when they meet me as a person um, and when they need to understand what my disabilities are and what types of accommodations that I might need. Um, and I think that with jobs, especially, I like to, I, I, I have found it beneficial for myself to play into the aspect of my perspective is very different than a non-disabled archeologist. I have a valuable perspective my disabilities give me that perspective. And I, I think that it's an, a, valuable, a valuable part of myself and gives me valuable things to say in the field that um, those who, like we were talking about the, the toxic masculinity, this, this was my point, there we go. Um, uh, with that toxic masculinity um, vibe that so many archeologists want to emulate, um, I don't have that perspective. Um, and I think it's an important part of our field, regardless of ability or identity. We already know that these queer lenses, that trans lenses, that feminist lenses are all important perspectives that add to our field already. Why is it such a different perspective when we're talking about disability? Um, why is there such a um, a fear about saying, you know, I have a disabled perspective. Let me tell you what I think. Um, I've taken a long time learning to feel confident in that and feel confident in what I have to say as an important part of the field. I study ancient medicine. Um, and in my field, there are not many disabled people studying medicine, which is as we all know, a very important part of disability. Um, so I think that there are important things that we have to say and whether or not you choose to disclose your disability, knowing that you have something valuable to add to our field is so important. And I want everybody to feel like they have important things to say because you do. Okay. And I think it's, a. Uh a really um, important point to touch on that you said that like it's very often that you'll find yourself the only person in your subfield because archaeology is so splintered like it's crazy wild that we have two Scottish zooarchaeologists <laughs> on one call about disability um, because uh, I do island stuff and Alex does mainland Scotland stuff <laughs> and so we're just working in very different parts of Scotland which is why my dissertation's comparative chapter is basically her dissertation um <laughs> and so that's but that's very rare it's very rare that you know especially because we're both migrants um that I've had a lot of support system within my subfield, but it all comes from Alex, who is also here. Um, and I think it's really important to, to point that out because that can be very isolating when you start to break down the field of archaeology, especially when we splinter off into our jobs and our professional careers. And I think that's another reason that things like Twitter and doing these types of panels are so important because they allow for that level of networking that allows you to also have these support systems. Again, I am like uh, going to be the odd guy out here with a direct support system within my very niche subfield. Um, Cause we both do like mammals in Scotland. It's not, that doesn't happen for other people. <laughs> and so I think that touches on a few things that people have been asking as well um, is, you know, 
Oh, there was a question. I have to find it on the list. Sorry, that I think fell into that. Oh, yeah. So from Christine Sargent, um, cultural. Yeah, and this is of, Amelia. If you don't mind, I'd like to make a oh. comment before you move on. Yeah. No, go ahead. Okay, great. I just, I think it's really important piece to add, especially for me. So, I mean, there are layers to, you know, invisible disabilities, you know, so many layers, you know, hearing people who have invisible disabilities, as you have mentioned, you know, I feel like you can kind of get away with a lot, you know, except for Cheryl and I, we mentioned and Allison, you know, just the service dog and the cane there, you know, you, you can't get away with that kind of invisible disability. And I myself can get away with that if I, you know, leave my hair down, cover my hearing aids, you can't see those. Um, but if I have my hair up, these are now visible. Um, and so people will, and people typically, for me, my hearing aids are white. Um, so they identify and they say, hey, what is that? Oh, you have a hearing aid. Oh, you're deaf. Oh, and it, you know, I respond, yeah. And typically people automatically think I'm deaf just because how I talk, the way I behave. Um, I don't, I don't, kind of code switch to behave like a hearing person. I don't do that. I, I, I feel like I emulate who I am. I talk like Amelia. I am, you know, like as I talk to my boss and my coworkers, the way we speak to one another, I am myself completely. And so I think maybe that's my personality and how we are raised and the environments and the, the settings we're raised in. I was raised in an incredibly strong deaf culture and community. And I do have deaf parents as well. Um, you know, so I have all of those th three things, you know, interplaying into the way I am, the way I, you know, show up in a space and also, yeah, how I, I identify per se. And then when it comes to a work environment, sometimes I get a bit concerned, you know, will I be hired? What, you know, and I think that's a, a whole different thing, you know, getting hired in the beginning beginning. I mean, it was like, I don't know, 10 or 15 unpaid in internships that I did. It was just a lot in the beginning for me. Um, but I never, I never kind of skirted around that. I never had told people, you know, I don't want to show up, you know, to an interview. I don't want to disclose my deafness or I didn't tell them that I, you know, I do, I tell them that I need an, an ASL interpreter. I feel like from the beginning when I started applying for jobs until this current day, I always said, yeah, I am going to need that accommodation. I am going to need that ASL interpreter. And I felt like I, I could do that in a way that was simple. And I think in the beginning, when I first started out, I was a bit scared, a little bit hesitant, tentative, say, hey, these are the accommodations. This is what I need. Um, very polite, very kind of accommodating to them as well. And I feel like at this point, I'm in a stage in my career where I'm really proud of my identity. I know what I need. I know what I want. And I think that I typically, you know, if I'm in an interview or any kind of setting, I'll say, yeah, I need an ASL interpreter. Keep it really simple. Move on from that. And, you know, deafness is a part of me. Deafness is a part of my identity, but it does not make my career. It does not it, my career is what I do. My career is my work. My deafness has nothing to do with my career. Um, you know what I mean? So I just trying to make it and keep those things separate and say, yeah, I am deaf. So, so you have a problem with that? Okay, that's okay. Then I don't want to work with you anyway. But thank you for making your ableism abundantly clear to me because that in that in that case, I'm uninterested. So I think that's how I've kind of worked through that with my work. But you know, it's been a it's been a progress. And I've been so lucky and so grateful that you know my bosses and my coworkers have been incredible. You know, just lovely to work with me. And they would always say, Okay, you know, in terms of communication, do you want a meeting for this? Do you not? And just always, I mean, just being great. And I think maybe it's because I'm here in Colorado, just I mean, a great state, a great setting. And I think just for me as a deaf archaeologist, being here has been wonderful for the last four years. Yeah, this is my fifth year here in Colorado. And I mean, all of my coworkers, my bosses, everyone has been so incredibly accommodating. So yeah, they, you know, I did, I went to graduate school um, and you, my advisors, my thesis committee, all of them were so willing to work with me, accommodate me. And so yeah, I've only really encountered one bad experience within my whole work career since I graduated in 2012 or 2013 until present day. I've had one, one bad experience in that time. So I just feel incredibly lucky. And at the same time, I do think um, archaeology is changing. I think I think as much as, you know, we all as archaeologists understand the culture, we really understand, you know, the value of, you know, working with people. And so I, I just feel, you know, as I, as from the beginning of my career as an archeologist, 2012, 2013, I've seen improvements every year. 
accessibility, I've seen improvements, you know, in, in, in coordinating with people, I've seen improvements. And so I feel like it's better to sometimes disclose my opinion and, and just, just, it just makes it easier from the onset. Say, hey, this is what I need. And then that, that precedent has been set. And then we just work together moving forward. And, and I think that there are some deaf people who will not disclose their deafness, you know, for a job interview or things of that nature. Um, I have a different approach. You know, my career, this career, I, I just don't feel like that's, that's possible with the amount of work that we are doing. You know, half is in the office, half is in the field. So there are little things like that that I make it, that make it impossible to disclose that. And I don't want to not disclose that. You know, I think it's a, it's a mix of both. I want to disclose that and we really can't. So, you know, and deafness is a part of my identity. So I just wanted to add that. I do feel like it's a little bit of an issue in terms of disabled archeologists saying like, you know, as you already know, you know, you know, I'm deaf, you already, you already know that. And so it's like, Okay, what is your disability? I don't know your disabilities, like your, your panelists. Um, so, you know, if you are a disabled archaeologist, what are your disabilities? And if you don't disclose those, then I, I, I feel alone. I feel like I'm the only, you know, disabled archaeologist. But it's nice to hear other people's experiences as well. And, you know, so I just sometimes feel a little bit isolated in this, in this field, being disabled, uh, you know, being an ASL user in this field. And yeah, I just, I, I speak and I can hear, I can do those things, but I prefer not to. And you know, that's just my, I prefer not to use my voice. That's a personal thing. I would prefer to just sign and use um, sign language. And so to just feel like I'm the only ASL user within this community, all of the other, you know, deaf archeologists don't use sign language. So I feel even more alone in those situations and just feel like there's layers of isolation, you know, and it's like, okay, I am, I can, you know, I can, I can just like agree with you in some ways. Yeah. And I feel like that last layer, I just feel as we go down that kind of hierarchy of disabled other folks, okay, you are also deaf. Oh, but you're oral and don't sign. Okay. And then we go down a level of, oh, I am the last person in this kind of field. Um, and I just feel, you know, the only person that uses ASL. So it's just good for me to disclose that, just automatically disclose that. Um, and it just helps, yeah, just feel less alone to me. So just kind of thinking of all of those different perspectives. Sorry. I, yeah, sorry. I will, I will be done after that. No, it's no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. That's, this is why we're here. And I just want to add that, especially because I think it really ties into Reed's question about, you know, disclosure as well, that this is something that has changed a lot over the years with me. I would go out of my way, not to wear my braces on my knees or my ankles, which some days I need all four. Um, you know, in interviews and things like that. And I no longer do that. I mean, if, and for any of you who do follow me on Twitter, I am obnoxious about being disabled. And that is something that came with a lot of confidence that I couldn't have had without having very, very supportive undergraduate mentors and um, Dr. Jane Baxter who at DePaul, who is an absolute peach, one of the best people in the world. Um, and my current PhD advisor, Chris Darwin, is also in incredibly um, supportive as well. I've had not supportive um, <laughs> advisors along the way. I've had not supportive bosses along the way. And it has definitely given me a confidence at this level of my career, you know, being in my 30s, I ran the, I was field director for my master's work. So I could feel comfortable in that field site being however I wanted. <laughs> And that level of confidence is also something that has changed in my level of disclosure and who I disclose to and who I do not. Um, and I think that that note about confidence, especially when we're talking about invisible disabilities and, and the ability to kind of try and pass if you feel uncomfortable in a situation, because sometimes that's a survival instinct, is very important to bring up. Um, and I'm very glad that you you touched on that, um, Amelia, because it is something I think that we don't often talk about in this is that um, invisible disabilities often get classed as fully invisible when often really we're not. And often we're making the choice to be a lot more invisible than we are because sometimes it's not safe or some, we don't have the confidence yet or we're not at the place in our career yet to be making those decisions. Um, I'm just at the place in my life where I no longer care. So I'm just obnoxious about it. Um, but I wanted to get to Christine's comment because I yeah. thought it was a nice um, 
would you mind if I add just one thing, Hannah? Oh, yeah, no, I think ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's, we do have that responsibility. We all have been in this field. We're all older. And I think that we do have a responsibility for that younger generation just coming in to say, it's okay to disclose. It is okay. You know, and say, if you're, you know, disclose that to your boss, if you want to. And I think just help, um, just empower them so they don't go through what we went through. I just, I do feel that I'm at the point where I say, no, I'm going to disclose because I feel like I do have that responsibility for my deaf peers. Um, and yeah, just saying I am deaf. These are the things that I need. These are the accommodations I need. And I do that. You know, I am the, the first person to do that. And then the next five who come through the door, they, they have the confidence to do that. They have, you know, and this company may have the confidence to work with them because they've already done it, you know, and there's just networking that happens that transpires from that. And so I do think that we have a responsibility to do that for the future generations. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons, uh, this is actually probably something I should have brought up in the very first section, but one of the first things I do when I do teach a class is I disclose that I'm disabled and I tell my students where they need to go to get accessibility on campus. And I tell them to please do that now because I cannot help them if if I don't know. And so I, I, I tend to be even more open with my students. If you think of obnoxious on Twitter, I'm even more open about it with the students I teach because I want them to make sure that they know if they need help with something that they can come to me. And if I'm not making myself available in that way, then they don't know that. Um, but just since we're, we're running on 15 minutes here and I, I, Amelia has a very good question that I want to be the last question. Um, I wanna get to this um, um, interdisciplinary question because I think it's a really good one. So uh, Christine Sargent asked, um, cultural anthropologist based in the US here, I'm curious whether or not, or how you feel connected to conversations happening in other antho subfields around disability, anthropology and accessibility in field work and academia. Um, and what kind of collaborations are we missing out on by staying in our anthro lanes? And I think this is a really interesting and good question um, because you do see a lot of disconnect between like, let's say the, the study of like classics of medicine can often be really disconnected from biocultural living people and anthropology where they're not really that disconnected if you think about it. And I know I'm a little bit biased because I'm someone who works um, of working on mammals and adaptation and evolution and that side of zooarchaeology, I also have to be very well informed about modern deer, red deer populations, because I have to know what's going on with my study species right now. And so I thought that this was a very good question, um, because there are so many ties there. And I do think, and there is very good at talking to people outside of our fields. If you're talking about, and there's like the four field idea, you know, the US four field idea. Um, and it's actually kind of bad about talking within the subfields. So does anybody have any opinions on this or feelings? Yeah, I can, I can touch on that a little bit. I know being within classics, even for myself, so I, I my, my hopefully um, waiting on application results uh, in the next couple months, but hopefully for my dissertation, I wanna look at bioarchaeology and classics in context, because there's still such a, a broad disconnect even between people who are studying bodies in the ancient world who couldn't tell the difference between a femur and a humerus if they if their life depended on it um and i think that those cross-cultural connections or cross-disciplinary connections and cross-cultural connections especially for classics we desperately need more of that um is really important um but i think especially within disability that's one of the places where i have been seeing more um discussion across disciplines like this panel that we're having um i think for, for the most part we represent a, a, a broad variety of different sub disciplines which is really exciting to see um but there's also a difference between talking about disabled archaeologists and talking about like the archaeology of disability and i think that it's important to recognize the difference between those conversations and also how they can inform each other um but i think that's a, a really good question that i i i don't know if what specific things we're missing out on because i don't i don't I, I i don't know um but i i suppose that there are a lot of them um that could be found if more people made that jump between different sub disciplines um and more and 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 actively went out and sought those collaborations 
So I'm going to put Alex on the spot here because she literally stepped out of her viva as an archaeologist and then went into an EDI job. <laughs> um, how was your experience? I know it's not necessarily an anthro job, but it is still, you know, it's, it's people. It's people. And that's still within, you know, the idea of this and it's interdisciplinary. Um, how have you felt in that, in that change of experience and, and your experience as an archaeologist who is now working outside of archaeology, um, kind of in a, in a field that actually looks at disability and other marginalized statuses? I mean, there hasn't been much of a change, really, because so much, if people are familiar with my work, I guess, um, I do a lot of my side projects, even during my PhD, were all based on kind of EDI approaches. Uh, and a lot of it wasn't really by choice either. A lot of it is necessity. And I think maybe other disabled archaeologists can relate to that need of doing kind of this EDI diversity equity work on the side, not, be, not necessarily because you want to, although it is interesting. And I, I do enjoy uh, parts of it. But there's a survivor instinct of it as well in that, you know, especially as someone who is uh, East Asian uh, working in British archaeology, which is 97% white, you know, I end up doing a lot of work on racism in archaeology and diversity of archaeology, not necessarily because I, I really want to do it, but because we are a very white discipline and it's something that I'm trying to carve a space for myself and for my friends and colleagues who are also archaeologists of color. Um, so moving into an EDI position actually really didn't change much because I was already kind of doing this work. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of interdisciplinary work, especially with archaeology, because my mindset has always been, you know, archaeology touches every type of fields. Ultimately, you know, we're looking at the the, the grand uh, history of everything. So you can do a lot of great interdisciplinary work. So it makes sense for kind of these movements and pushes for further diversity and inclusion to become a bit more interdisciplinary. I've been actually working with anthropologists, um, specifically with uh, the Society of Medical Anthropology, working on uh, kind of protocols with uh, for them and talking a bit about mental health and things like that. And it's been extremely interesting, not only to get the perspectives, but also kind of see where that overlaps. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, potential for that kind of work to continue for sure, uh, interdisciplinary work. Uh, between us and anthropology and probably other fields that, especially fields that do field work, uh, other fields in the humanities, things like that. May so I jump gonna, in? Oh yes, go ahead, Cheryl. <laughs> so this goes, the last couple of questions are kind of related, I think. Um, my support system for how to do a task uh, as a blind person has always been connection to other people who are blind in different scientists, science fields. Uh, some of my early mentors were engineers. Uh, so if I needed to know how to collect data, what to use with a screen reader, how to use Excel, when it makes sense to take notes in Braille, all those questions I asked outside of archeology span in other science fields. And I continue to monitor access in other science fields. And astronomy and physics, get some money from NASA and they're doing a lot, um, which is surprised to me. I've been in meetings with astronomers talking about how you show data plots and also play them in sound. And it's absolutely fascinating uh, having the curve go up and then down in pitch. Um, I know nothing about astronomy, but I monitor those conversations and contribute because I know about sound and how I understand that data in that they're presenting. So moving in from that broad into anthropology, the questioner can, if they want to pop it back into the chat, if they're referring to the recent conversations at the American Anthropological Association conference, yes, there is a lot. Um, there's someone in eth ethnology, um, I think at one of the University of Minnesota campuses, who was giving a presentation about different tasks in ethnographic fieldwork. 
who takes the notes, who transcribes the interviews, who does the, the different tasks. And Laura Heath Stout in archaeology has talked about who does the different tasks on an archaeological excavation, who draws, who writes, who climbs down the ladder, what have you. And yes, some of those, that knowledge base needs to be more broadly disseminated. People need to start thinking, matching a task base with an individual's capabilities and not matching, like Laura, I'm gonna quote Laura, because I love it. She said in one of her last presentations about archeology is the, the lone genius yielding a pickaxe. You know, the, the, this, as Bill mentioned, the toxic masculinity, the sheer physicality of field work. And it's really, it's a rabbit hole. It's a dead end. It's not helpful to the vast majority of people in archeology, span I believe. And we really need to get to a task-based set of assignments rather than an all encompassing, the one size fits all stereotypical Indiana Jones archeologist with a pickaxe. That's a great, absolutely great point. Um, and I think that's a good point to end the bulk of our panel on. I'm gonna rapid fire through a few things before we get to the comment, uh, the, the comment slash question that Amelia had brought up um, in our group discussions that I really wanted to end on. Um, so we've had a few people um, bring up things like federal agencies can hire qualified people with disabilities that forego the traditional hiring processes, which tie back into a lot of the job stuff. And also um, have asked if there's, this is also a very professional thing, um, have there any been any attempts to reach out to certifying institutions like the RPA? So because Christina Kilgrove is, is attempting to do very good work at the RPA, but unfortunately a lot of these certifying institutions, and I don't need to dunk on the RPA in particular in any way or form here, any way, shape or form, or any individual conference, which are, you know, adjacent to certifying institutions. But a lot of this is just about building up um, your networks, because like I had no idea that federal agencies could directly hire qualified disabled people and skip the processes. Um, I had no idea that that was possible. Yeah, they can do that. They can do that. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad somebody brought that up. Someone else from the BLM that's is how actually I got hired. That up. I was on that list at one point. Yeah. And um, I think one thing is, is that RPA in particular could really learn a lot from CIFA, which is um, the organization here in the UK. This, uh, is it charter? It's chartered. Is it chartered, Alex? It's chartered Institute of Archaeologists. I always forget if it's chaptered, chartered, or what the C word is. Um, they actually have like subgroups and subcommittees and things like that that are related to like women in archaeology and disabled archaeologists and education in archaeology. And I think that that is something that the RPA at this point is just not doing. And that's not, again, not to dunk on the RPA. I, I see that there's definitely validity in things like the RTA, RPA, but right now the RPA is just- I wanted to add something to that. Um, I, Amelia, um, so the RPA, uh, they are doing their part because they have, um, they had a chair, they had asked me, they reached out to me about uh, disability resources and a list of people. So they did contact me, the RPA and the AIA, both of them have reached out to us. I think it was SAA as the one group I've not heard from. Of course. Wow. I know everyone is really shocked to hear that. Um, I say fully really meaning funny. that as sarcastically as that sounds. Um, <laughs> Um, but there are things that I think um, American institutes could per could be borrowing from CIFA um, in their structure and being open about it, because I will say that I've spoken to people at RPA as well before, um, but it's more of a behind the scenes thing rather than CIFA is, is very all hands on deck and very open about it. And I think that's one of the things we're missing with RPA and a lot of these like people I not agree. knowing that federal agencies have these direct hire processes. Um, and just one last thing before we get into Amelia's, um, cause I do think this is very important. Um, and I'm not gonna ask for a group question on this because we don't really have the time for it because we technically have one minute left and I don't wanna go too over. Um, in the US and in, in, in most um, countries with um, higher in higher education systems, you aren't allowed to ask students um, if they're disabled or if they need help. 
And this um, ties into um, what a student has actually asked, you know, um, how do you engage with archaeology if you don't feel comfortable in academia? And I think those tie in very well. And all I can say is that from the staff professor side, you just have to make yourself as open as possible. If your students feel safe with you, they will come, come to you. They may have too much of a trauma response to come to you, and there isn't anything you can do about that, unfortunately. All you can do is be, sorry, I, I set timers to try and be on time. Um, all you can do is try and be as open as possible. And I would say that also implies to engaging with archaeology, be open to experiences, find your niche. When you find your niche, you may find that academia is possible for you with the right people. And that's been my experience. Academia has worked with me for some people. It worked with me very well. At DePaul, it did not work for me at my master's institution. Um, and that was a learning process. And I'm not saying that you should immediately go back to academia because you found you had a bad experience, but sometimes it is just about finding your people. Um, and that's what's important about um, doing these types of conversations. And I think that is a perfect lead in to, I'm sorry, we'll probably go about five minutes over just so everyone can get a comment in on this so we can get Amelia's very good ending question out there, um, which was, as a disabled person, do you feel included in the profession? No, short answer. <laughs> no, short answer. Yep. From individual people, yes, I have been very lucky um, to have had some really incredible mentors and advisors who have gone to bat for me and said, look, she can do this. You are missing out if you don't bring her on this, um, this dig or this project or this program, whatever. Um, but in the discipline as a whole, absolutely not. Um, I think that's changing. And I think that that's starting to, there are more and more of those people who are non-disabled, who do care about our experiences, who do care about including us in the discipline, but it's not that it's still a smaller percentage than it could be. Um, but I think that a discipline is made up of people. And yes, there are a lot of people who are really not welcoming to us as disabled people. And that's part of why things like Whisper Networks and naming- Whisper, who, network, whisper Networks yeah. are very important for any very marginalized true. people. <laughs> yeah. and, and, the, and, and the isms go together. Yeah, absolutely. If you, know, if you find out that so-and-so is having trouble uh, as a person of color, then probably they're gonna have trouble with you coming to to them generally as a disabled person yeah the people who don't like me because the people who don't like me because I'm well I won't say don't like me but uh look at me differently because I'm queer are the same people who will never get spoken to about my disability because if you can't accept that I'm queer and bisexual then you are definitely not going to accept the very long list of medical conditions that I will ask you do you want alphabetical or by body part um those are there they are generally going to be the same people I have problems with I will say that my experience has been that just because someone accepts me as queer does not mean they will accept me as disabled and that is where mm -hmm. I think disability fills its own weird niche where it gets left out um and unless anybody has any really really pressing comments they would like to end on I think that's a good note to end on is that you know that intersectionality is where things often get left out and unfortunately, that is what it is. Oh. Okay. Um, are we done? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we are done. And I just want to say, uh, hand it back over to Chris so she can say our, our thank yous. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> that is all the time we have. And so please join me in thanking Hannah, Alex, Allison, Bill, and Cheryl. And thanks to the interpreters and the captioner for doing such a great job today. Thank you, Jeremy and Kayleen. And thank you to all of you for tuning in to join us today and being part of this conversation. There is going to be a link to a survey in the Q&A box and will pop up when you exit the webinar. We hope that you'll take a moment to respond. We are very interested in your input as it informs more programs like this in the future. So thank you again, and we hope to see you all next time.